Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to start this new series of um, of webinars, of uh, hidden webinars now uh, with the uh, hidden network with Ilaria Brivio, who is very, very familiar with uh, these networks. She was uh, hired uh, in the first iteration when it was called Invisibles. And she did a PhD in Madrid uh, with the network, and she moved to to Niels Borg in Copenhagen, and now she's in uh, Heidelberg. And she will tell us about uh, the new developments in this uh, interesting neutrino option. So thank you, Ilaria. Thank you very much for the invitation, for having me, for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so. I'm going to talk about the neutrino option, which is a. Uh, I'm going to try to give uh, a sense of uh, the, the core idea, at least, and cover a bit uh, the works that have been done around it. So, um, the part of my work that I will uh, tell you about is contained in these four papers uh, that are here: the original one with uh, Mike Trott, and the uh, the second one where we refine a bit the analysis, and then we have a paper on leptogenesis and one on UV completions, which also kind of gives more or less the agenda for. Um, for the talk. So uh, even though it, it sounds really uh, connected to neutrinos, it is connected to neutrinos, but the story uh, actually starts from uh, a slightly different point of view, which is um, the hierarchy problem. So the fact that uh, the Higgs potential, so the Higgs mechanism is a nice description of the Lithuanian symmetry breaking, but it's lacking a, a dynamical origin, which is at the origin, as you all know of many problems, so the hierarchy problem, the stability, the reality, and, and so on. Um, so coming from, uh, say, the expertise of uh, effective field theories, just to set the language of um, that I'm going to use in, in, the, in the next slides, the way that uh, the hierarchy problem is usually stated in uh, effective field theories is in terms of uh, threshold contributions. So the idea is that uh, whenever you have some sort of having your particle, so like a vector, a scalar, or a fermion, like in these cases, that can couple to the Higgs. What happens from the FT point of view is that when you, you do the operation of integrate them out, so you remove them from, uh, from the spectrum, you generate uh, some contributions that do not uh, vanish as the mass of the new state goes to infinity, but they remain finite. In fact, they actually are proportional to the squared mass itself because it's contributing to a two-point function that needs to have uh, mass dimension too. Um, so the hierarchy problem emerges uh, as a question of, uh, of threshold matching contributions in this language. And uh, the, the way that the usual solutions are pictured in this view is that you can have essentially two approaches to, to this problem. One is to force cancellations between the different threshold, which is kind of uh, this, the Susi idea. So the fact, the idea of having, for instance, the scalar and the fermion contribution be related by some symmetry, which forces them to be equal and they cancel off. Or you can try to suppress them. And this is, for instance, the idea of the composite X. So if you want to have um, a, a suppression, you can, for instance, impose a shift symmetry, which basically forbids the entire uh, scalar potential that is therefore um, naturally, naturally suppressed. Now, uh, we're all familiar with the uh, down, downsides of these kind of solutions. One is that they all require resonances not too far from the TV scale because they basically try to solve the problem right close to the electric scale. So the particles need to be need to be there. They need to be close to it, uh, and that essentially the the scalar potential needs to be generated all at once. And this is not a trivial operation because one essentially needs to um, find at the same time the right shape of the effective potential, but also comply with experimental constraints, which is, again, a statement of the fact that you need to have something close to the electric scale. And there's tension in trying to separate these, these two things, even in the case of, uh, of the compositics. So the idea of the neutrino option starts from uh, something that we are now very used to, which is the fact that uh, since we measure the Higgs mass, we can actually control uh, the RG running of the scalar potential of, uh, of the standard model up to higher energies. So the idea is that one could move, in a sense, the stabilization problem from the TV that is down here to another higher scale, for instance, 10 PV, uh, which will pop up later, which is where 
using the one loop RG, this is roughly where lambda crosses, uh, crosses zero and changes sign. So these that you see here are two um, plots on top of each other. So the, the red line is referred to lambda, so it has the left axis, and the blue line is referred to uh, the Higgs mass, so it goes in the, in the right axis. And this is basically the RG of uh, the standard model potential having fixed the boundary conditions and the rhetoric scale and at one loop. So the, the basic idea is that one could work again in the EFT uh, sort of perspective at a high scale, have some sort of new physics that fits, fixes basically the, the threshold corrections to the mass and to the quartic coupling at the very high scale, and then let this run down uh, to the electric scale using the RG of the standard model. Because at this point, if you assume that did whatever new physics generated your threshold, uh, the couples, then below uh, this scale, you don't have uh, any any BSM particles. So your your only dynamical degrees of freedom are the standard model ones. So the RG are just the, the standard model ones. Basically, you just fix uh, the boundary condition at whatever matching scale you have. So this is actually a, a general idea. Uh, and the, the case that we applied it to, this is where neutrino comes in, is the type one um, seesaw. And that I think you're all familiar with. So you, you just have uh, extra right and neutrinos in the spectrum. They have a kinetic term, they have a Majorana mass, they are Majorana particles, and they have Yukawa couplings to the Higgs boson and, uh, and the leptons. The only thing that is funny here is that we're gonna call the Yukawa omega. I apologize for that, uh, but this is the denotation that we use in the, in the original paper. So when you have, whenever you have the uh, the type one seesaw and you do the thing of integrating out the, the retina neutrino, you have a three-level piece of uh, the matching down to the standard model, which is the one that gives uh, the dimension five Weinberg, Weinberg operator and therefore the uh, Majorana mass of the light uh, left and the neutrino. And then you have one loop contributions to the scalar potential. And this is actually all there is, you also have corrections to the Yukawa coupling. Uh, no, sorry, that sorry, that the couple. So that's basically all that there is uh, in the matching that you do uh, from the seesaw coming uh, coming down. Um, so here it's interesting because you see that you have the contribution to the Higgs mass that scales like the mass of the earth and the neutrino squared as expected, and then you have the contribution to um, to the quartic coupling that scales like the Yukawa to the fourth and is dimensionless, of course. Uh, and this calculation was done already a long time ago. And this is usually associated to uh, the hierarchy problem of the seesaw. So you might have seen this already in the context of putting um, an upper limit, so a lower limit to the uh, mass of the, of the right-hand neutrinos in the form of the hierarchy problem. Uh, so the question that we want to ask here instead is, uh, can we actually generate basically the Higgs potential in the way that I was saying before. So using these as the initial conditions and then running down with the RG um, using the constraints from the seesaw. So in a setup like this, you have uh, two free quantities, which are the scale of the Majorana mass and the size of the Yukawa coupling. Um, you can also have flavor uh, structure, but I'm not I'm gonna ignore that. If you assume that, that basically the two uh, right handed neutrinos are nearly degenerate, you just have scales like really orders of magnitudes but you have three sorts of constraints because you have two constraints from the yukawa coupling and one constraint from the neutrino masses of course you don't want to lose um to lose that kind of uh, of constraint so i'm a bit cheating here in the sense that in principle in the lagrangian i could also have uh, additional terms so start from their terms in the um in the scalar potential, but the first thing that we tried really uh, in the original idea was to try and generate the full potential genuinely from this. So really basically starting from a potential that is not only basically scale invariant, so without any Higgs mass to begin with, but it is really completely vanishing also the, the core term. So now this is not an ideal way of doing this, uh, and I can anticipate that and we, we fixed it, but let me say just quickly what comes out of um, of this idea. So if you start off with essentially only uh, the Yukawa and the Majorana mass, and you want to uh, basically fix this in order to, uh, to check if not an option works, one thing that you can do is to use as conditions the, the two parameters of the Higgs potential, and then use the neutrino mass as a cross-check for consistency. 
So we did this in the very first work and long story short, uh, you can basically fix uh, the Majorana mass from the constraint on the quartic coupling and the Yukawa, once you have fixed the mass, uh, you fix it from the, from the Higgs mass in this case. And if you do the back of an envelope calculation for the size of neutrino masses with the numbers that you get out, you find uh, that this is of the order of 10 to the minus three electron volt, which is actually very nice because it's in the ballpark of what is allowed by, uh, by the cosmological um, constraints. And the points that are identified uh, are the mass of 10 to the seven uh, GeV, which is 10 PeV, uh, and the Yukawa that goes to 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five in the side. Now, this result uh, had some unburied bodies in the sense that it was just a preliminary analysis and we did it with one loop RG, but we were very aware of the fact that if we actually used two loop RG or even three loops RG, then um, doing this sort of reasoning would move us towards uh, higher masses and lower Yukawa coupling, which means two small neutrino masses, so smaller than the, 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 the solar mass splitting, basically. So definitely too, too small, even assuming that one of them is completely massless. So we redid the analysis and in a more appropriate way, adding basically uh, a bare uh, lambda parameter. So this condition is easier to satisfy uh, because you can always forbid the Higgs mass from being there by assuming that you have the scalar potential, which is nearly conformal. So like advocate the conformal symmetry as a protection. Um, but for the lambda, you don't really have any, any protective symmetry apart from uh, the shift. Um, so it is relatively hard to, to impose it. So this is more general. And of course, it always has a solution because now we have three variables and three constraints. Um, and the, another thing that we changed in this better analysis was that instead of fixing uh, the scalar potential to begin with, we set to fix uh, the Higgs mass and the neutrino masses, and then we checked what is the value that is needed for lambda, because that's basically adjustable uh, independently. And in doing this, we also added uh, flavor effects. So we basically didn't work only with two quantities, but we really uh, included all the mass splitting and mixings, uh, assuming that we have only two massive uh, light neutrinos, so only two heavy Majorana uh, degrees of freedom, and we took into account also the RG running of the neutrino mass of the mixings using the Kazasipara parameterization. So what we found was actually much clearer, uh, and, and it was a much more solid result. And the reason is that having chosen to fix the Higgs mass and the neutrino mass as conditions, um, this is very convenient because these two quantities do not run much. So the neutrino mass is always protected. Uh, so it doesn't uh, move very far from, from its small value and the Higgs mass also doesn't run at all. In fact, in the plot that you see here, uh, the red line is basically the value okay, the scale is very large. but This is basically the value of the Higgs mass uh, then runs up from the standard model. So with the matching condition fixed at the standard model and running up, and you see that this is basically stable. Uh, while the bands are the value um, that you find, so starting from the neutrino parameters at low energy, running them up uh, and defining and calculating basically the, um, the matching contribution to the Higgs mass using the neutrino parameters that are measured and run up and as a function of uh, the lightest heavy neutrino mass essentially. And they define a band because of course for the neutrino masses and mixings you have a range. So this is what this is reflecting. And basically in, in this plot, the neutrino option works wherever the band meets uh, the, the red line because it means that then you could have a common starting point um, where you know that if you have that kind of threshold correction, then the neutrino masses are going to run down to the correct value by definition, and by definition, the Higgs mass is going to run down to the correct value. So the, the result that we find uh, is actually that, that, that you can have um, any mass below 10 to the 4 TeV, so again, 10 PeV, uh, or 10 to the 7 <laughs> GeV, depending on the units that you prefer and a Yukawa coupling that is roughly one over M in units of a TV. 
Uh, and this is a very solid result, again, because these two things don't run much. So you can really do it with a dimensional analysis, just with a rough scaling. Um, and, and you can solve the equations in the mass and in the Yukawa size. And the two bands that we have here is that because we try to do this in two cases, so one when uh, the heavy the neutrinos are fully degenerate, which is uh, the blue, and this is precisely the, the, the mass range, uh, the one identifies for the, um, for the Majorana mass. And the yellow is when uh, the second one is 10 times heavier uh, than the first. And you see that basically the preferred range moves down by an order of magnitude, which basically means that the only mass that matters is the mass of the heaviest guy, which makes sense in, in, in the philosophy of the hierarchy problem. It's always the heaviest mass that talks to the Higgs, which um, creates the, uh, the issue that gives the largest contribution to the Higgs mass. So it's the heaviest, the one that, that matters. So the limit is an upper limit because it's basically um, a preference on the heaviest mass, then you can have more, but they need to be uh, lower than, uh, than this. Now with these uh, ranges, then we went and looked uh, at Lambda. Um, so the, the windows here, this window identified by where the, the red line crosses the yellow band or the blue band, uh, they are marked by dotted uh, lines here and here. So left and right are actually uh, the same plot, but this is in linear scale and this is in log scale for positive and negative values of lambda. Um, and here one would like to play the same game with, with lambda, so uh, the, the values um, for which the neutrino option is realized is whenever the value of lambda that comes running up from the standard model having fixed the standard model condition, so the, the red line crosses with the values that are allowed by neutrino physics for the matching uh, contribution, which are the bands. Uh, so it's basically these values here. And you see that depending on which RG I use for the standard model, if it's a one, two, or three loops, um, the scale at which this happens changes very much. But in none, in no, so in none of these cases, this is the same mass window as the one that I would need for. Uh, for the Higgs, which are those that are here. So basically the conclusion is that if you want to satisfy the neutrino option inside these windows, you need to have some sort of offset uh, that brings the, uh, the threshold contribution up to match where it should be in order to round down to the correct value. Now, this is really not an issue because anyways, uh, because lambda essentially always runs uh, to, to lower values, uh, this always stays uh, perturbative. You never need anything non perturbative. So whenever, um, whatever value, you find is basically allowed, so this doesn't really add any, any constraint. And this is the summary of um, the results that we find changing all the possible combinations and variables that, that we could. In the end, the baseline result is the one obtained with uh, three loops RG, which is the, the plot uh, <coughs> to the right, and uh, say fully degenerate uh, Majorana neutrino, so the blue lines. And then the differences between uh, the shades of blue is what value you assume for the top mass. So for the lightest top mass, you need to have larger values of lambda zero. And for um, smaller top masses, you need to have smaller values. Sorry, larger top masses, smaller values of lambda zero, they are crossed. And the triangles versus the, uh, the blobs are if you want inverted or uh, normal hierarchies for the neutrino masses. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, these are just uh, several points. The important point is that you can always, whatever lambda zero you need, you can always find it in the perturbative range. And just for the uh, sake of consistency, the point that you see uh, here that is very close to zero in the RG equal one is basically the one that we found in the original analysis. So this was particularly nice because it looked like one could start from lambda equal zero, which is kind of a special point. But then actually, if you move the RGs up, this is not the case anymore. All right, so I think I can pause here before I go to how one uh, does leptogenesis in this um, in this scenario. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, yes. I see Chavi. Hey, Larry. So, quick question: There, what you are talking about normally, or or, or inverted ordering? Are you talking about just mass scales, where you are also considering the mixings? Or... Yes. So here I'm talking about uh, the, the usual neutrinos. 
So really the, the usual, uh, the, the three lightest neutrino, the, the lightest one is massless in our case because we only have two mm -hmm. heavy Majorana guys, uh, but it could be the one or could be the three. So it's, it's really that one. And then all the, the mixings were taken into account uh, correspondingly in, uh, in, in the running up uh, to obtain the values of the threshold corrections. And then, so when I see these results and just adding one, two or three loops, the results change quite a lot. Uh, so can we trust that, no, these three loop results is something there, or if you add four or five, everything will change a lot? I think it can change, but it shouldn't matter that much as long as, um, as the lambda runs down. So you start off from the standard model value here, and then it starts going down. And if you add loops to the RG, it looks like you change by a lot the point where it crosses zero and it runs slower and slower. But the important thing is that it runs down. As long as it runs down, you're going to find that, that this band is crossed uh, somewhere between here and, and here. And it's always a positive and perturbative value. So at some point, I mean, what I mean is that at some point, increasing the number of the RGs these points move up, but at some point they will reach like a threshold. They don't move higher than uh, than the standard model value. That cannot happen. Okay. So it, it's always fine okay. for approximation. Okay, thanks. Yes, Julie. Um, I was wondering if you also considered the um, case of three uh, massive neutrino, so closer to the quasi-degenerate picture as uh, well. We and if you find the lambda. We didn't, and I think uh, nobody else has done it, as far as I know. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't create a big issue. The thing is that you can lower so the only thing for which it could be useful is that you can lower the mass of the lightest right-handed neutrino because the one that matters for for the actual bound is the heaviest uh, so like here we kept uh, the lightest uh, sorry how is it uh, yes so basically the heaviest always needs to be here and then if you if you allow them to be to be different then you can send the second one to be to be lighter. And if you had a third one, you could have the third one to be even lighter. Uh, so maybe it could it could lead to something vaguely observable, but I don't think it can be I don't know, way too low. So uh, and it doesn't it doesn't really give a big uh, a big difference, I think, in the in the final message. Could be interested if you could see it, but I don't think you can bring it as low as the TV. I haven't tried. Okay, but you, you expect that you will find some lambda um, that will, that will, there will it's, be It's still gonna be in, in the perturbative range. I don't yeah. think that's gonna change. Okay. Mm -hmm. It can Thanks. be that it changes a bit where you identify the, the Higgs window, but. All right, thank you. All right, so there's nothing else I can, I can move on to leptogenesis. So one of the first questions that, that come uh, to mind at this point is, okay, fine. Uh, you have a scenario where you basically have uh, only type ones you saw, and this takes care of the hierarchy problem and natural amino masses. So it's already a good point. What else can you do? Uh, and the next two points are leptogenesis and dark matter, of course. Um, so for leptogenesis, uh, the usual classic option, so like thermal leptogenesis, is not really available in this case because um, the mass range that we identify violates the Davidson Ibarra bound. So you, you need to have the masses below um, 10 to the 7 for the neutrino option and above 10 to the 9 for thermal leptogenesis. So this does not uh, work out. There are modified versions of thermal leptogenesis. We denounced our matrices in the Casas Ibarra parameterization. And this we uh, checked, um, but they are not uh, viable either because 
you really meet a tension between the fact that you either obtain too large values for the for the Higgs mass, or you start having extremely large tunings in Euclidean loop contributions to to the light neutrino masses, and it's really like many orders of magnitude. So this is really not ideal. Um, one thing that we know worked is uh, the resonant leptogenesis uh, that, that we studied together with uh, Silvia Pascoli, uh, Sergei Petkov, uh, Jessica Turner, and Christian Moffat. And that was also looked at independently by this other group of people that were partially in Heidelberg and partially in Padova uh, back then, now they all moved around. Uh, finding basically uh, consistent results. Then more recently, last year, there was another paper uh, that looked at something different. I'm not going to cover this uh, here today because it's a bit uh, far from, uh, um, from the discussion, but essentially they say that if you embed this into scenario when you can have also inflation and so you, you sort of you be complete partially the, the model, you can also have uh, a non-thermal production, assuming that the temperature of overheating is below uh, the Majorana mass. So you can check it out if, if you want. So for the uh, resonant leptogenesis, um, as I was saying, we looked into this. And so the, the resonant leptogenesis essentially happens uh, whenever you have the, the mass splitting between uh, the two and neutrino. So we're still um, assuming two of them only. Uh, is comparable to the decay width. So basically, you have some sort of amplification uh, in, the, in the symmetry by the mixing of, of the two um, heavy states. So the question that we uh, set off to ask is whether there are any points for which you can satisfy uh, the Higgs mass constraint and the baryon asymmetry constraint simultaneously, having imposed, I mean, given for granted, the neutrino mass. Uh, constraint as well. While at this point we really forget about uh, about lambda, so lambda is completely irrelevant for for the leptogenesis uh, condition. So the point is that uh, what the leptogenesis analysis is going to give you in the neutrino option is a constraint on the mass range of the heavy neutrinos again. So this is again the other thing that, that matters for the baryon asymmetry. So we did this in two ways. Um, one way was using an approximate solution of uh, the Boltzmann uh, equations. So basically, uh, if you use the Casasivara parameterization, you can write uh, the threshold correction to the Higgs mass in this way here, where now y is the complex uh, part, so the imaginary part, sorry, of the angle in the R matrix in the Casasivara parameterization. So it's basically the part that sources the CP violation in, in here, and you have a cubic dependence on uh, the Majorana mass. So basically, if you want to identify uh, the preferred range in terms of masses by biogenesis, you can try to find the minimum by maximizing the value of uh, the CP violating parameter. Um, and you can try to identify the maximum, the upper end of the mass by setting the CP violation to zero. Now, it turns out that this part um, is basically always, um, so it doesn't give you any constraint in the end of the day on the mass because you can always compensate uh, having set Y to zero with modifying one of uh, the other phases. So basically you don't really get any upper limit uh, to the heavy mass. So the only limit that you have still is fixed by, uh, by the mass of the Higgs. Well, on the other hand, uh, you do have uh, a lower limit on the Majorana mass um, in this way because you have the, the baryon asymmetry scales like uh, an exponential of minus y. So you can, so by minimize, sorry, by, by maximizing uh, y, you can really find um, the maximum value and then translate it in terms of, of the smaller m. Sorry, it is confusing. In the other day, the result is the following. So the lower limit that comes from leptogenesis um, is around 10 to the 6 GV, so not even too far from the upper bound. And this is the upper bound that you have from basically just the, the Higgs constraint uh, written in a bit more accurate way than before. Um, and the mass splitting uh, that this corresponds to uh, when you want to play the, the resonant uh, game is 10 to the minus 8 compared to the absolute value. So it's a relatively small um, mass splitting, but that okay, was part of the assumptions in the resonant uh, leptogenesis. You can also do something else once you have understood more or less how your system works with simplified equations, which is uh, doing a numerical analysis with exact Boltzmann equations. Um, 
And at this point, uh, you can basically choose to fix. So in order to do this, basically, you need to fix some, the values of some parameters and vary over some over uh, some others. So at this point that we know what are more or less the boundaries in the um, in the Majorana mass, we can sit, for instance, at the value that is that is minimum, so 10 to the 6 GV roughly. And at that point, we can fix um, the CP violating parameter from the constraint on, uh, on the Higgs mass, so a minimum M, maximum Y, and then do a scan over the other parameters. And if we do this, uh, then we can go and project over, for instance, the mixing parameters of the of the neutrinos, and these are only two quadrants of the full uh, multidimensional analysis that we did. Uh, and what this tells you is that once you have decided what your Majorana mass is, uh, this mechanism gives you some sort of prediction, or at least of a preferred region uh, for the angles. Uh, so the CP violating phase in the PMNS and the the mixing angle. So it kind of gives you a preference for one of the quadrants for theta 2, 3, for instance, depending on the hierarchy that you're assuming uh, for the for the neutrinos. Uh, on the other hand, if you sit at the point where m is maximum, I told you before, you can even set y to 0, and you can always satisfy the leptogenesis uh, request by varying the other phases. You can even ask another question on top of this, which is, uh, could I have enough CP violation um, from uh, the delta phase only and not from the Majorana ones. And it turns out that you, that you do, so there's really a lot of, uh, of freedom on the, on the upper hand, let's say. So these are plots that were obtained setting really all the Majorana phases to zero and y to zero, so you only vary delta. And there is one precise point that is uh, preferred by the value of the Majorana symmetry that you need to get inside this space. Of course, it's not really a prediction in the sense that it's a prediction once some assumptions uh, are made, but it's still interesting that the system is, uh, uh, let's say, restricted enough to give uh, a precise uh, indication. Uh, and I, I was telling you, yes, so this is about two, 230 degree, 250, depending on hierarchies. So I was telling you before that uh, the Adjada group did also um, an analysis in parallel. Um, I'm not going to enter into details. They took a different um, path. So this is a very large uh, parameter space with many dimensions. So we decided to fix some things and very others, and they had a different strategy. So for instance, they started to look for uh, the, what maximizes delta M over M, uh, having fixed um, the, the the y. So their z1 is the same as, as our y. Long story short, the results uh, essentially agree. They also find that this is viable, and the regions of parameter space uh, are also are also compatible. Then the plots can be a bit more instructive, depending on what you want to uh, actually understand in this parameter phase. All right. Uh, so about uh, UV completions. Now, the point of the neutrino option um, was more to uh, give an idea of how the hierarchy problem could be addressed uh, that is a bit different from, uh, let's say, more classical approaches. So, uh, for instance, the, the, the threshold value for the Majorana mass uh, of 10 to the 7 GV was often uh, described in the literature before as basically the uh, the hierarchy problem uh, limit for the Majorana masses. So instead of saying something like this, one could say, well, okay, instead of saying that this is the point where I have a problem, I can say that this is the, pro the point where I generate the Higgs potential and I actually solve um, the problem. And it's a principle that can be applied to other scenarios as well. Uh, but it does not really uh, present a full solution uh, in the sense that uh, we thought of it as a sort of a simplified model or effective uh, sort of, uh, of description, but it does have um, some, some missing points. So it's not a fully UV complete model despite being in dimension four. The main issue is that uh, we want to start from a condition where the Higgs mass is nearly vanishing. So we do have uh, a nearly conformal condition, but we do have a Majorana mass. So it's a condition where uh, there is one scale in the Lagrangian, which is both the scale of um, conformal uh, breaking and of the violation of the lepton number at the same time. And one kind of needs to explain uh, where that comes from in order for this to be, to be satisfactory. So in doing this, uh, it's uh, not necessarily an, an easy operation uh, because all the mechanisms of the Radnantin option are quite uh, delicate. 
Um, so the request that one has to make is that you need to have at least the two eigenvalues of the Majorana mass at the PEV scale in order to have the neutrino masses work out right. You need to protect the mass of the Higgs from other large uh, contributions, which means, again, in sort of an EFT sense, preventing this interaction to, to be generated by the action of some other uh, heavy field. Uh, it needs to lead to a stable vacuum, so it, you need to make sure that it doesn't uh, cross regions where the vacuum is unstable or this could be uh, problematic. Uh, and that DRG as well are not uh, spoiled by other light DSM states. So you can have in general a model that adds uh, light new states, but it doesn't, so they cannot have a dramatic impact on the evolution of these quantities. Otherwise, you would identify very uh, different scales. Uh, and then you want to avoid fine tunings because that was the whole point of, um, of the idea. That's the, the thing that you want to, to stand by. So there are a few options that have been explored so far. Uh, so by far the most explored are, are conformal completions. Uh, there was one initial paper by Manfred Lindner and collaborators, so again, the people in uh, the Max Planck here in Heidelberg, uh, which then went on to uh, a whole series of, uh, of work developing this idea and even connecting it to, to gravity in uh, this paper of last year. Um, so I'm going to discuss a little bit um, next the uh, the, their idea and what, what they are proposing. I cannot get into too much detail because it's not my work and I'm not a super expert on, on conformal models, but I can give you at least an idea of what um, what kind of problematics one, uh, one needs and what kind of signals one finds. Um, then there are string theory uh, completions that have been suggested just as, a, as an idea, and I'm also not going to enter into this. Uh, and there's also a possibility of having some sort of uh, perturbative generation of the Majorana mass from the Planck scale, for instance. Uh, and this idea that we had um, at some point thinking about this, noticing some uh, numerical accidents, but ended up being uh, a no-go theorem. So these are uh, UV completions that you really cannot uh, pursue, that you cannot uh, address. So, I'm going to cover this uh, very quickly and then move on to the uh, conformal completions, which are those that, that actually work. So the idea of having a perturbative generation of the Majorana mass um, starts from an accident, which in, if you want is a, is a relative of the numerical accident of the fact that uh, neutrino masses point to the gas scale. Uh, if you think of them in the Weinberg operator style. Uh, so the, the mass that we identified for the neutrino option is at the 10 to the 7 GeV. And this is uh, with our value of the Yukawa coupling, which is 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, basically one loop factor away from either the Planck mass or the gas scale, one of the two, depending on where you are. Um, so the fact that this is at one loop factor away uh, makes you wonder if you could start from the, the Planck scale or God scale at somehow, uh, which in principle can have some physics that is completely uh, blind to flavor and therefore would, would create, for instance, by condensation or some you know, perturbative mechanism, a Majorana matrix that has only one and therefore has only one uh, eigenstate. If this is perturbed, you can have uh, two eigenvalues, so have kind of uh, two values of the Majorana scale. And then from here, with one loop correction somehow get down to the PV and generate uh, the PV scale radiatively so that you have a two stage issue then from the PV you can go down to, um, to the antenna option as before. Now this looked interesting, uh, but it turns out you cannot. And at one loop you cannot because simply uh, you don't have one loop diagrams that violate lepton numbers by two units in the type one CISO. So you cannot generate non-zero eigenvalues out of nowhere. And if you already have an eigenvalue for the Majorana mass, you cannot lower it by that much with one loop RG. Uh, this requires a lot of, of tuning. At two loops, you do have uh, violations of the lepton number, so you can generate um, Majorana terms, Majorana entries that were not there before, but you have a two loop suppression. So you have uh, basically a numerical factor that creates a large tension between um, the heavy mass and the X mass uh, generation that you cannot escape. There is also a symmetry argument uh, around here, which is if you assume that you start with one, you can also generalize this to two. Um, 
the, the Majorana master basically in this condition satisfies a U2 times a Z2 symmetry where the U2 uh, covers the, the first two rectangular neutrinos and the Z2 is flipping the sign of, of the third. Now the Yukawa interaction, which is the point where the, the heavy mass or the heavy neutrino talks to the Higgs, uh, is invariant under the Z2 only if basically the third column is exactly zero. So you know that in order to generate the Higgs mass, you need to somehow break this, this, to, this uh, Z2 symmetry by some amount, uh, or at least you need to break it even to generate some uh, light eigenvalues. Uh, but the moment you do it, um, the corrections to the Higgs mass are, are just too large, essentially. So you have the two conditions when the Z2 is preserved and in that limit, absolutely nothing happens because this guy is completely isolated, doesn't interact with anything. Um, and you have the limit where it's softly broken. So here it could generate another um, Majorana mass uh, that you didn't have before, but then it talks immediately to the Higgs. So you need to have a tuning of at least 10 to the minus 14 for this interaction, which uh, violates one of the assumptions that we wanted to have. So this ends up being a, a no-go theorem for this sort of perturbative uh, generations. So something that instead uh, works, I confirm my UV completions. Um, so the, the very first um, study by Berliner and collaborators um, who looked at this uh, basically found that in order to UV complete the neutrino option in a way that respects the conformal symmetry, you need to, to add at least two scalar singlets, there are S and R here, uh, where one of the two has a Z2 symmetry, and then implement, for instance, a gilner weiberg uh, mechanism in order to have a dynamical breaking of uh, scale invariance. So the gilner weinberg is essentially the fact that you have one of these quartic couplings, for instance, lambda S, uh, that runs and at some point comes to a scale called lambda GW, where it crosses zero. At that point, if you set this to zero, you see that basically uh, you have a spontaneous symmetry breaking um, at this scale. So the, the S takes a VEV and it has also a, an associated Higgs boson. So like the, the radial excitation that becomes, that becomes the, the scale on um, of, of the symmetry breaking while uh, the electric symmetry breaking and the R remain uh, preserved. So you can have a two stage Breaking first, you break the S. The S goes to, ge to, to generate the, the Majorana mass. And then basically the Majorana neutrinos do the, the game of um, putting the Higgs potential where it should be for the electric symmetry breaking at the second stage. Now, uh, as in any model where you have a lot of uh, scalars in the potential, um, you need to have some sort of restrictions because scalars tend to uniform uh, to, to each other and to, to be all very connected. So you need to impose some sort of conditions. Some of them are required in order to uh, have the gilner weinberg mechanism in that, that works. Some of them are required in order to avoid that uh, the symmetry breaking happens in the wrong direction or that it happens too early at, at wrong values of, of the scale. Um, so there are many that you can check on, on the paper. The two important ones here are that uh, the portal between uh, the Higgs and the Scalon has to be very small uh, because otherwise, again, you generate directly the Higgs mass uh, close to this uh, Vs and that the portal to the R uh, scalar has to be smaller than some ratio of the other, um, the other parameters, essentially. The good thing is that uh, if you do a scan of the parameters, you can find regions of parameter space which are sizable, where you can satisfy simultaneously the Higgs constraints, the neutrino constraints, and you also make sure that you don't have Landau poles until uh, the Planck mass scale, basically. And for instance, in this plot here, uh, lambda SR is one of the parameters that play the, the biggest game into identifying which um, points are viable. The, the green points are all points that are uh, successful. So you see that also the Yukawa for the uh, Majorana guy, for instance, remains of uh, perturbative order. And so the Majorana mass is naturally of the scale of the web of the scale. Uh, what is fine tuning in here? Well, OK, this model at some point um, has some sort of tuning that you need to, to quantify. So I told you that lambda HS, so this 
guy here has to stay small. Uh, how small you see it on, on this scale, so the, the values that are preferred uh, are 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 16, so it's a very small range. But one can argue that this value is natural as long as the RG equations don't take it naturally to larger values just by applying the usual um, TOPS principle. And that happens if this parameter here, Xi, that I suggest as a measure of, sorry, um, of fine tuning remains uh, very small. So if this is always this is always larger than uh, than one. And you see here the points. So where it's smallest, so points where this could be natural is again the green region. And then the, the farther you 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 get from uh, from the diagonal in this plot, this is the the product of Fukuyama's. Um, the more tuned your model is uh, technically. And then finally, one interesting thing that they found is that uh, this sort of, uh, of mechanism of the carousel or the custodial, uh, yeah, yes, okay, now I'm saying all the symmetries except from, <laughs> from the conformal. So this mechanism that you have from the conformal symmetry breaking basically generates um, first order phase transitions that can give you gravitational waves. In principle, you can go and measure. So they took some uh, benchmark points in the parameter space that's actually allowed by all the constraints. Um, and you see that they can also be within the, uh, the observable range in the near future, let's say. Uh, you could also add uh, dark matter to this uh, sort of setup. Um, I actually found more than one example in, in the literature, but to uh, remain close to, to this kind of model, um, one way that you could add dark matter is to replace essentially the gilner weiberg mechanism with um, a strongly interacting hidden sector that has some sort of condensation. So in, in order to have uh, the spontaneous uh, breaking of scale invariance, um, you, can, you can have something that condensates like, like in QCD and have it uh, in, in this sort. And if you do it, basically having uh, a symmetry that condenses with some strong interacting sector gives you for free Goldstone bosons, so like pions of, of the symmetry breaking. And these can be um, dark matter candidates. And it also gets you that you need one less uh, scalar. So you remain with, uh, with the scale on here, but you can get rid of the, of the R um, scalar. So this is a variant of, uh, of this model, essentially. Uh, it's still has some sort of fine tuning. So again, the, the portal between the Higgs and the other scalar needs to be uh, smaller by quite a few orders of magnitude multiplied by the, so depend with respect to the Yukawa of the, uh, of the right handed neutrinos. Uh, and this is just to give an idea, the, the values of um, the, the, the dark matter mass. So what are the values of the scale that they identify? Well, it depends on what you fix. But for instance, for um, for Majorana masses of 50 PV and setting lambda HS really to, to zero, so preventing really that, uh, you can have that essentially the, the VEV of the scale on is to the 10 to the 10 uh, GV. And the mass of the dark matter is about a couple of orders uh, of magnitude lighter than that uh, for typical values, so perturbative values of, of lambda S. Um, so this ends up with dark matter that is actually heavier than uh, the major neutrino, so it's going to be a very uh, heavy state, but that you can produce with the right relic abundance by freezing, for instance. And they did identify some of these um, allowed regions around here. So in principle, you can um, you can embed this into uh, into more complete scenarios, and these are kind of complex models, but that. Uh, in principle, do not uh, alter uh, the, the phenomenology at all. And um, they cannot be very easily excluded also because everything happens at a very uh, heavy scale. So the um, elements that you have to uh, to face are those of the usual measurement of relic abundance and neutrino masses and nothing more complicated than, than that. And with this, I think I'm done. Uh, so I'm gonna leave this summary slide um, here. Just as a recap, this was the idea of the neutrino option. And the only thing that it actually really predicts uh, as a very preferred value are the, are the, the ranges for the Majorana mass and the, and the Yukawa couplings. Um, it also has this kind of fascinating aspect that uh, 
you have the deleterious symmetry breaking is, is controlled by the same thing that controls the lepton number violation, uh, which is uh, uh, which is interesting. And the fact that you get uh, the the Higgs mass with the right sign is really characteristic of having fermions um, in the running the loop. So it really applies only to models we have fermions. Um, it is consistent with leptogenesis. It admits uh, interesting UV completions. It has the up and down side, which is a blessing and a, and a curse uh, of not really predicting um, many other BSM signatures. You can have collateral signatures in specific UV completions, but by itself, uh, everything is basically locked up at the uh, end of scale of the PV. And yes, this will be all for me, so thanks. Thank you very much, Ilaria. That was very nice. And we had already uh, uh, several questions, but we have time for more. So if anyone wants to ask anything, just go ahead. Yes. Uh, hello, it's Leandro here. Can I ask a question? Sure. Thank you very much for, for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, uh, so I, I wanted to ask uh, what is special about the, the 10 PV scale? Uh, do you recover any symmetry or something like that? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't uh, get it. And, and uh, in case uh, it is not special, um, well, uh, what happens if, if you move away from the body? And it, it happens. Uh, it happens because it's basically where you start having the hierarchy problem in the type one CSO. So you can go back to, this is really the paper by Vissani in, in the nineties. Um, mm -hmm. That's this one here, you can check. Um, so that, that's, that's really the reason why, why this pops up. So if, if you do the calculation of this threshold correction and you equate it to the Higgs mass, like really uh, stupid as it is, you find 10 to the 7 here if you want to have the right neutrino masses as well, which you can say as, you know, in usual conditions, they would be the hierarchy problem. So when the threshold correction is as large as the bare contribution, or you can say, let's say I don't have any bare contribution and this is my Higgs mass. That's basically how it comes about. There's nothing, there's nothing more around there. And it's also why it's very stable. It's always the same number in whatever analysis I've seen, also in UV models and so on. OK, great. Thank you. Jose Ramon has his hand raised. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Laria, for this very clear talk. I have a question. When you say that the, um, uh, that the CISO generates the potential, uh, I'm, it's not clear to me that this happens, because what happens to the potential when you run above the CISO scale? The potential is still there, right? Uh, you're supposed to recover a conformal condition, so you still have the quartic, but not the Higgs mass. That would be the idea. But this, this is what happens really when you run the, the uh, renormalization on group equations? No, well, you, you assume that, so you, you run up the, the RG and then you assume that at some point you meet a threshold after which you do have uh, the heavy neutrinos. Then, okay, you should add the heavy neutrinos to the RG and do the running in, in the CISO model. This is what you're asking. Yeah. I, I, uh, so you're saying that it can be that the RG adding the heavy neutrinos basically creates, so like it breaks the, um, the conformal invariance by itself. I don't yeah. think so. Uh, but honestly, I haven't checked. And this, all this is for uh, even for getting gravity because gravity is going to be there to mess the whole thing up, no? Uh, yes. So you need to have some sort of mechanism. For this, you can check the latest by uh, by Lindner. Uh, they also have gravity. So you need to do it in a specific way where you have. So what he has is, for instance, a model where you, ha you have that also the the Planck scale is generated as a conformal invariance breaking, essentially. So you have one big thing. Uh, you, you can make it consistent. So it's not necessarily a, a no-go way. Uh, but I agree that, I mean, you have to specify something like this set as it is, like only type 1 CISO does not hold up. Right. OK, thanks. Hello. I have a very short question, Ilaria. Um, 
which is Maria Jose Herrero. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, regarding your slide number 12, where you show the running of Lambda. There. Um, one very, very simple question. Don't you have any problem in connection with the stability of the vacuum in getting negative Lambda values above a given scale? Uh, I mean, in principle. In principle, you would. In practice, we don't here because we assume that we stay up here, whatever happens. So, like, we would have a problem uh, if uh, the Higgs constraint preferred a mass window where we need a negative lambda to start from, because there you have to explain how you end up in a place where you have a negative lambda and then everything goes fine. Right? How a bit artificial, no? You are yes. treating perturbatively the thing. You consider one loop, two loops, and three loops. The results are very different, as uh, Xavier already commented. And you have to really fine tune a lot uh, the starting point, not to get into negative values, and yet uh, getting to low energies the correct values. Somehow is my interpretation of this plot. So in other words, if you don't be very careful, you may enter into negative values, really such that uh, stability is uh, broken somehow. So I mean, it's, it's not forbidden yet. I mean, like if you start off with a bare value of the cortic that is negative, then, then you are cooked. I agree. But and the statement is that this can work fine. So it's not, uh, there is no constraint in this plot, really. This plot is not telling you anything. It's just telling you that whatever you do is fine because because the mass window that you're interested in for, for the matching is below 10 to the 7. And at 10 to the 7, lambda has to be positive already. This you know from the standard model running. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not different from the standard model, right? No, the, exactly. I mean, I Anything that else can Yukavas, be. Your Yukavas are too small to change the, the, the issue of stability as it is in the standard model, I guess. Yeah, but the stability in the standard model is up to very high scales, assure. So it's well, not, it's you, it's exactly into that. Your scale is where, where you, then you have problems. I mean, the, the stability is up to here, exactly. No, but you're not, I mean, you are saying that you, you run up only up to this window with the dotted lines, and then from here on, you start having the type 1 CISO. So you have to worry about what the type 1 CISO does to your scalar potential there. Mm -hmm. um, but your Yukavas are very small, no? So. The Yukawa is 10 to the minus four. So usually the neutrino running doesn't do much, to be honest, but I don't know. I mean, it depends on how far you want to extrapolate. Like if from here, then you want to go up to Planck scale, then maybe something can happen, but then clearly it's still not complete, no? Okay, thank you, Ilaria. I don't see any other hands. So I don't know one else seems to be asking, but I want to ask my a question myself. Um, so you, you were playing this game when, when you discussed um, leptogenesis. Uh, you were uh, fixing it's a very large parameter space, as you said. You were fixing some parameters, and that allowed you to make predictions on on things like beta two three and, and delta indeed. Now. I guess this would change if you change the parameters that you are fixing. So I guess the question is, is there any value of delta or theta 2, 3 that is not compatible with leptogenesis and would be kind of a way to falsify? The uh, that's an interesting question. I'm afraid that the answer is no, but we have not checked it. But the, the reasoning is simply this. So this, the plots that you see here, are, for instance, those that you get at the minimum value of the Majorana mass that is allowed. And then you know that drifting from here to the maximum, uh, your constraint loosens. So mm -hmm. when you get to the maximum, anything is possible, even having only delta works. So basically, okay, it's not necessarily a monotonous behavior, but for sure, if you get to the maximum value of the mass that you can, then you have much more much more freedom. So I, I cannot give you a number or a plot. We didn't really do it. Maybe in the plot from the other guys, they did the different things. So maybe one can kind of infer that. But I don't, I, there is no th there is no clear signal that, that tells you what the phase should be. Almost also because you always have the Majorana phases that you can always play with in the background. Right? 
We don't know it. I see Sari has his hand up again, so go ahead. Yeah, a quick question about the Togenesis now that you mentioned. Yeah, I was wondering, I mean, the talk was about avoiding fine tunings, but for this resonant leptogenesis, you were setting the the mass splitting, I don't know, 10 to the minus eight or something like that, which is kind of fine tuning by itself. Uh, have you considered a mechanism to generate that small mass splitting? Or? Not really, to be honest, but again, so, Okay, then mass bleeding has to be small because you know you have to go resonant. So you're going to have something small there anyways by definition. Um, we haven't really looked into generating this, but one thing I know is that in any of the works that looked at UV completions and so on, they also checked that kind of leptogenesis still remains uh, that, that makes sense. Uh, and it does. So it means that you don't really have problems even if you want to, it's kind of like a parameter of its own. You can always fix uh, independently. It doesn't seem to be causing uh, main issues. So it's not excluded, but how you get there exactly, you know, we have not looked into. Okay, so I guess, there are no other questions, so thank you again very much. We'll get here to our clapping. I will also clap. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Pilar. Ciao.